don't know if you've ever had that before, but it was the Russian keeper with the keeper grains, which is truly the keeper keeper that we all think of. Keeper. Yeah. Okay. Which I is. Give those grains away. Yeah. Not your grains. They grow. Yeah. We you, give them away all the time. Yeah. Well, you take raw milk, add the grains in, put it in a glass jar, let it sit for two days, and what do you know? You got keeper. It's fermented. It's it's kind of this effervescent, wonderful, tangy, sour, they funky really stuff. Well yeah, it works great. It was that's what it's grown for. Well, that does not have what's called a standard of identity in California. S O I. Everything we produce has to have this legal thing passed by the Congress that says it's defined. You could do it. It's legal. It's regulated. Here's the here's the standard for it. Doesn't have a standard of identity. Russian a keeper grain uh, raw milk does not have that. We were making it out of light colostrum, which is not—it's not a dairy product. Light colostrum for ten years was not regulated in California. It was a dietary supplement because it was not fit for human consumption. Of course, we loved it, but the bottom line is, we take the third or fourth day, we keep colostrum, and, and and the CDFA couldn't touch it because it was colostrum, not milk, even though it was like eighty percent milk. But We'd add keeper grains into that, fermented, we had a label, sold, sold like crazy throughout the state of California, and it was raw Russian keeper, but it was a dietary supplement. We could not use the word milk on that bottle, but it was like mostly milk. About three years ago, the state of California said, no more. The FDA just reclassified colostrum as a dairy product. Arbitrarily, they just changed the rules. Okay. Like, well, that's real nice. No hearings, I think. No, the FDA is just a, a big meat cleaver. So in California, the dietary supplement people at, at Pat Kennelly at Department of Health Services said, we're pulling your permit on your dietary supplement. You can't produce it anymore. By the way, go see CDFA. They'll talk to you about it. Went to CDFA. I got in both the room. They said, there is no standard of identity for raw milk uh, keeper in California. You can't make it. So we were put in a no man's land. We had a product that had once been legal, but now it's illegal. So whew, we negotiated kind of the middle ground. Said, OK, well, there's a standard of identity for keeper, but it's with addition of known bacteria and no yeasts. So what you're getting now is the bacteria found in raw milk, which has a diversity of bacteria, plus the addition of 12 known bacteria but no yeast added. That's why it tastes a little different than the Russian keeper, which has a lot of yeast, and 30% yeast. So I personally think that Russian keeper is more medicinally aggressive because it has more of a probiotic diversity. It's got the, the beneficial yeasts in it and all that kind of good stuff. Um, Ours is very good, but it's not, I think, as good as the Russian keeper. So if you get the Russian keeper stuff, that's really the, the bomb and you're going after a gut problem like Crohn's or irritable bowel. But ours works really, really well too. Because it's got all the raw milk bacteria, which has some yeast in it and stuff, and, but we add in 12 of these other bacteria. Now, here comes the hat trick. For a year, we didn't have any keeper in the market in California at all. We were just scratching our heads going, how are we going to do this? Because they passed a law in 2007 that said we have to have less than 10 coliforms per milliliter in the finished product of all of our dairy products, except for cheese. How are we going to do that? You put milk into a vat and warm it up, everything grows like crazy. And you're going to have 10 million bacteria per milliliter. And the coliforms are going to be God knows how high. Well, that was not an easy thing to do. We figured it out. The cultures we add into the milk when it warms up are extremely aggressive at attacking and reducing coliforms. It's also acidifying. So these are predatory bacteria that actually don't like coliforms. And so they consume the coliforms, and at the same time, lactobacillus and bifidobacteria go nuts. And you get a low pH of 3.6. So you go from 6.6 .6 to 3.6. So it acidifies it, and you have these coliforms under control. Now, there's a food safety trick with coliforms. Coliforms are everywhere, by the way. Coliforms are everywhere. They're your friends. However, there's a nasty little sucker in that coliform. It's called E. coli 015787. It's a submember of that family. Rarely, rarely, we've never found it in the milk, in our milk ever at organic fashion, but it can be found in the coliform family. So, if you have a really low level of coliforms, it's virtually impossible. It is mathematically impossible to have E. coli 015787 make anybody sick because it's a subclass and it's always going to be a one one ten thousandth of a part of this family. So, our coliforms, if they're really low, E. coli 015787 is not a factor. Well, E. coli 015787 really attacks kids badly. Hemolytic uremic syndrome. We had a recall based on that in 2006, which is in dispute because it was in the middle of that big uh, um, spinach deal. It was oh, 30 people God. dead, 200 people sickened, and we were recalled in the middle of it because we had three kids in the hospital during that period of time, exactly the same thing. We ate all that spinach, but it was a different bugs than the spinach. Very disputed thing. The state of California paid for our recall, had us sign a release that we wouldn't sue them. We were back up in seven days. Big dispute. But the bottom line is, I learned a lesson from that. 
E. coli, O157, is a member of the coliform family. If you get your coliforms next to nothing, you won't have the E. coli ever to worry about, even though you can test it separately. So that's why a lot of our food safety premises are based on keeping your coliforms low. Coliforms coming out of the udder are extremely low. I'm talking about one, less than one per milliliter. Very, very low. Unless the cow has mastitis. And that's why I use that Impingo app on the iPhone to keep your mastitis out of the herd. So you actually don't have coliforms. Your odds of having E. coli are like nil. And that's where food safety has made a quantum leap forward based on what we've done and applying that research from UC Davis and other places in the actual world. So that, I think that answers the question of, of, you know, about where we are and how we're getting there. It's, it's, there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of very <laughs> exciting things going on. And I um, hope I answered the question. I got to derail the things I want to talk about. Um, are you concerned at all about the radiation? I'm concerned. <laughs> and what are you radiation. doing about it? Great question. I'm more concerned about the drought. Yeah. yeah. We have wells. But I tell you what's interesting, we've tested our milk three times in the last two and a half years since uh, Fukushima occurred. Uh -huh. And because of the drought, we don't have the radiation. Yeah. Rain brings radiation out of the atmosphere. The jet stream carries radiation from Fukushima across. Yeah. And so it's interesting that in the areas that rain more, like Northern California, Oregon, Washington, have measurable increases in the radioisotopes that are found in Fukushima, where Southern California literally has none because there's no jet stream coming here and there's no rain being carried that actually brings it to the ground. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things about that is if you do have Fukushima tech fallout radioisotopes, it's uh, interesting that um, clay, uh, what's it called, bentonite clay, uh, iodines, uh, fish-based minerals, uh, ocean-based minerals, and raw, uh, raw fats are some of the best treatments for it. So a strong immune system and all kinds of your body basically deals with it then. But weakened immune systems, not having the right trace minerals in your body, um, bentonite clay is actually a treatment. If you had a raw milk source that had um, these high levels of isotopes, if you actually add bentonite clay to it, shake it up, let it participate out, and you would not have it in what you drink. The bentonite clay actually takes the uh, isolated isotopes out of the milk fluid. Thank you. Uh, Fukushima, the big uh, nuclear reactor that blew up in China. Pan. Oh. It's still, it's still, it's, yeah, it's not resolved yet. Just it's not pretty. I mean, I think it's payback for us dropping bombs on them, I think. Myself. Yeah. Um, the entire the, Western Hemisphere, though. So, really? But we live on planet Earth. We can't, like, call yeah. a hole. We, we live here, you know. So what are you doing this, this summer and measures for this drought? For this matter? We have five wells. And we do not have a long-term solution. But I'm pretty sure that you get into this, there's so much money in farming that there will be a long-term solution, and it's basically going to be probably bringing in water from Northern California and bringing in water from, from Oregon and Washington, where they're awash in water. There's so much water up there they don't know what to do with. And they can't farm like we do because it's the climate is so darn wet. So they need to get rid of their water. So I think there's going to be this kind of a thing. I, I saw a, uh, a very nice video from 1962. I was a year old, 52 years old then, um, of JFK. JFK, John F. Kennedy, is landed in his, his army. It's not Marine One, it's an army helicopter right at where the San Luis Reservoir was going to be built. And you can see the valley, the San Luis Valley behind it. And here he is making this big speech about water being a, a national security issue, water being a resource we all need to share. There's parts of America that are completely in drought that need it. There's parts of America that are swimming in water and need to get out of it. Let's move the water around. It's a national long-term vision. We've got to get our act together as Americans to feed America. And at that time, we just talked about feeding the world, too, which we do a lot of, too. We're feeding China right now. But bottom line is, California is in a drought situation, has been for a couple years. In other words, our use of water exceeds its ability to supply. But we do have these deep wells. Uh, three years ago, we had almost we had a major amount of water. Four years ago, we had this huge when we were like decimated with water. So we have failed to plan for that year and reserve it for years like that. We just let it all wash out to the delta. There are ways to keep the fish alive and also build our aquifers at the same time. We at Organic Pastures pump our water from the ground. Water there is 4,000 feet deep. We're, the water stands at 150 feet. There's quite a bit of water, but it's a matter of how much money do you have to go get it and what's the quality of it. Farmers are fighting over water right now because a lot of the farming was developed in California, especially the west side, was developed on surface delivery, and they're getting zero. There's a lot of people screaming right now saying, my almonds, my almonds, and they're willing to pay $1,500 an acre foot for water anywhere they can beg, borrow, or steal it. Wow. So there's water money to be had to support, and remember, almonds, 80% of all the almonds in the world come from California, and almond milk. So I mean, all these things going on that are driving people to get Obama to land in Fresno yesterday. I couldn't find my airplane yesterday. Huge TFR. I could be like, 
temporary flight restriction. He couldn't fly across <laughs> anywhere. I was grounded. <laughs> Helicopters, I mean, crop dusters couldn't fly yesterday. So anyway, bottom line, Obama came, made a little speech. I think his, his um, boxer's solution sucks. It's about giving people money today and no fish hooks for the longer term. I mean, I don't have a problem with taking care of people today so don't starve. The bottom line is, where's the longer term solution here, guys? We need to have infrastructure. And that creates jobs. So it's about investing. California has a very unique climate in that we're at two to 500 feet above sea level. We're a desert area, very arid, very rich, fertile soils. We have the Sierra Nevadas. But you go to Oregon, it rains like crazy. You have shorter seasons. It's cold, it's, it's rainy, it's uh, stormy, it's snowy, it's icy. You go to Arizona, you're three to 5,000 feet. You have too much of an elevation problem there, and you also have very cold winters. You can't do almonds there. So there's billions of dollars in some of these crops, and I believe in the, in the short term, two to three years, if, it, if the drought persists in another year, there will be an absolute freak out, and there will be major, like a hundred billion dollars come in to put in pipelines and that kind of stuff, because there's just so much political will to do so. And it will be job, it will be job stimulating as well. Because so much of the world's food comes from California, and our food. And when you go and take a shower in San Francisco, it's like, <laughs> it's awfully dry for my soap. Uh, people start voting differently. Right now, it's like, no problem. We've got hand touching and we're cool to go. But when that stops, or they say, oh, you got three minutes to take your submarine shower, people will wake up and go, wait, change things quickly. And they'll start voting differently. But right now, we've got kind of a division where you've got the politics of the cities, which don't see water as a problem because they always turn the spigot. That's where water comes from, the spigot, right? <laughs> this is like food comes to the store. They don't see the reality of it yet. But when they see it, in fact, all their lawns are brown, and they don't have a spigot to turn on, and uh, when you go out to dinner, they don't serve your water anymore. You, know, you, bring, you bring your own water bottle, and water has become a commodity. <laughs> then it's actually a different reality. And that's where I see it going. Uh, we'll be okay in the next two to three years, but I think five years, if it was a long distance, we, we'd actually have to move. 